And my dad says, Wally, I will never forgive you for this. Not for coming to West Africa, but I was able to talk to my parents on the phone just twice in two years, and letters took six weeks to two months. And my father found out, I, I'm still angry at the person who told him that Peace Corps had given me a motorcycle. <laughs> and I had no idea how to drive a motorcycle. They just gave it to you and a helmet and said, bye-bye. <laughs> and um, so he was even more upset. Being here in, in Lagos, I've learned the bravest people in the world are those driving motorcycles <laughs> in this city. When I am being driven around, I see motorcycles, I have to look down. I'm waiting. I'm just, and not an accident, not one. They seem to always know where they are going. So, um, but enough of those stories. It, it, it's just so great to be here. Could I get the next slide from you, please? By the way, I've given this talk without slides at all. It was Clemson who made me give him <laughs> give him slide ten. I just go forward here, do you think? I don't want to touch a button. It may. Oh, then and, and the one after this. Oh, stop there. I'm sorry. Can you go back? So at the bottom is my email. I am retired. So when I get back to the United States, although I'm actively doing research all over the world, I have a lot of time. And so that email is walterpagecarson at gmail.com. I've already replied to multiple emails for my time in Abuja, and so I'm happy to answer questions about what I'm going to talk about. Uh, so could I now get the next slide? <clears throat> next slide. Next slide, please. The one I, advice on writing. Okay. I'm going to give you some very simple tips on writing. This is about writing in the sciences how, or anything. I recommend that you Google the top 10 writing trip tips and the psychology behind them. It is only four pages long. It took me 15 years to learn what Josh Burnoff condensed to a grand total of four pages, and it is brilliant. And so he is actually, he is an advisor to business and how in business and communication to improve your writing, but it, all of it applies to sciences. So I'm gonna go through a few things. And one of them is gonna be what I call AAA. -A -A. Of course, none of you know what AAA -A -A is. AAA -A -A is avoid acronyms always. Often in science writing, people love to use acronyms. In some cases, your science writing DNA, nobody writes out DNA anymore. Some acronyms are, of course, easy to use. Everyone knows them. But if you're not sure that your audience will know what that acronym is, and if you're not going to use it, the acronym more than, more than eight or ten times, write it out. Because it gets in the way of prose. It's just a very simple thing. Just avoid those acronyms. And then I'm going to talk about active voice. The other is passive voice. Learn. It's one of the toughest things science writers can learn to do, but it's actually pretty easy. Some grammar checkers will pick up passive voice. If I threw a ball and you saw me throw the ball, you would say, Dr. Carson threw the ball. You would not say the ball was thrown by Dr. Carson. That's passive voice. Active voice makes your audience, your reader, feel like they're a part of the writing. So go ahead. And it's important. Google active versus passive voice. I assure you that active voice is not, re I mean, passive voice is not recommended. These are, vi these are very simple tips. And by the way, you don't have to trust me. You can trust Josh Bernhoff because it's one of the 10 things that he talks about. And the other thing is the use of first person, plural, and singular. You're writing in science and you found something cool. You filled a knowledge gap. And if, if usually you will have co-authors, 
don't say it was found that X was discovered. It gives too much credit to it. Who is it? We found X. And that is how you would never look at me. You would never look at your colleague and go, it was found that uh, elephants are important in structuring tropical forests in West Africa. You would say, we found that elephants structure tropical forests in Africa. So it is perfectly fine, not as fine, it is better to use first person singular and plural, I and we. This next one is going to se seem arbitrary. I only really adopted it myself about a decade ago. Long sentences get in the way of understanding, especially on complex topics. Science is complex. It's full of nuance. Don't drag your reader through a 75-word sentence with dashes or colons or semicolons. If your sentence is longer than 35 words, carefully edit it down so it's less than 35 words, or turn it into two sentences. Brevity is the key in writing on complex topics. So it's a great rule of thumb. There are exceptions, but they're rare. So just, it's so easy to go through your manuscript. Is that sentence more than 35 words? I need to fix it. And I literally do this myself. I'm not kidding. And I also catch myself writing in passive voice. And I've been trying to write in active voice for a while. So the great Watson and Crick, James Watson and Francis Crick and Rosalind Franklin, discovered the structure of DNA. They are probably in the last century, the most important biologists that lived. When they discovered in 1953, their famous paper in Nature describing um, DNA. Well, I got this quote from Francis Crick. I didn't meet him, I saw it written in paper. Politeness is the poison of all good collaboration in science. Let me say it again. Politeness is the poison of all good collaboration in science. And I don't mean you should be mean-spirited or condescending, but you want your best colleagues to give their most substantive critique of your written work or if you're giving a presentation. So if, if somebody's giving a crappy presentation, you want to tell them that because you're their friend and their colleague. Don't, don't let them go off to an international meeting and give a poor presentation, or worse, submit a manuscript for publication in a high impact factor journal when you know there are problems. You must give them hardcore constructive critique. And you don't need to be mean, but you don't necessarily have to be polite either, okay? And this is kind of said in fun, but I wanna drive the point home. Finally, edit, edit, and edit again. I'm going to be, I have had drafts of manuscripts when I'm sending them. Let me step back just a little bit. Uh, I have been an editor for somewhere around eight to 10 high impact factor journals in my field, meaning that I make the decision on whether to accept or reject a paper. I know how hard it is to get papers published in high impact factor journals. And so five drafts is not enough. 10 drafts is not enough. Edit, 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 and 40 drafts may not be too many. So remember, it's draft, it's a draft by draft process. Before that, it's a paragraph by paragraph process. And before that, it's a sentence by sentence pro process. Make each sentence count, make it compelling, make it brief, and make it concise. So, okay, this is just some very basic tips on writing or what I have time. But again, the top one um, by Josh Bernhoff, you can find it instantly, it'll come right up on Google. Um, I just taught a graduate class, the last graduate class I taught was in uh, September and October of 2021. And I spent three hours with advanced graduate students going over these 10 tips. 
Can I get the next slide, please? So now I'm going to talk about publishing. And the goal of this is to help. It doesn't matter where you are, um, whether you're in West Africa, you're in Western Europe, or you're in the United States, North America, or I work a lot with Central American and South American graduate students. So I'm going to say this, titles matter. I will typically come up with 10 to 15 titles for a manuscript I'm going to submit for publication. And I'm almost never the sole author. Usually there's anywhere from three of us to 10 of us as an author. So titles matter. Sit down with your collaborators and come up with a compelling title. If you send me an email to my email address, I can send you and will attach a checklist of how a checklist for writing a manuscript. And the very first part of the checklist is your title should probably reflect the most important and compelling finding in your paper. So send me an email, I'll just reply, and we'll attach the checklist. And by the way, I borrowed it from uh, uh, an outstanding senior scientist. I guess I'm a senior scientist now, I retired, um, but I borrowed it from him 15 years ago. And because it was such an outstanding checklist of check each box, I do X, and there's about 20 boxes to check. And you can just go down and see if you can check those boxes. So, and the other thing is abstracts matter. Scientists are busy. I guarantee you I do this, all scientists do this, professors, uh, researchers at institutes, they read your title and they read your abstract. And if you suck them in, you've made it sound like what you found is compelling, then they're likely to read further. So make sure that your title and the abstract, especially the last three sentences of the abstract is the big take home message. And it can be bold. In some ways, you want to make them go, really? You think you found X? You have to prove it. And then they'll go read the rest of your paper. If it doesn't sound interesting and compelling, whew, they're just going to move on to the next paper. And you want them to read it. And that way, they cite it. And we all know a thing called Google Scholar. You can get on Google Scholar, type in my name, and you'll know how often I've been cited. Right? And so citations, 20 years ago, that wasn't true. It is today. Um, convincing the editor-in-chief to send your paper out for review. Every major journal or minor journal has an editor-in-chief. And then I never was an editor-in-chief. I didn't want to be one because I was an active scientist and it takes so much time. But I was a subject matter editor for multiple journals. The editor in chief at major journals is going to read, probably spend less than 20 minutes. She or he or will download your paper, or maybe even will just call it up, you know, when it comes through the journal portal and read the title and the abstract, and they're busy. They may have to handle 20 decisions that day. Do I send it down one level to the subject matter editor, someone like me, and every journal has 50 to 100 of those. They find the area of expertise. Okay, I think Dr. Carson should handle this paper. But at many journals, it'll never make it to the subject matter editor because the editor and chief read it and said it doesn't rise to the standard of our journal. So you have to get it through an editor in chief. And that's why titles matter and abstracts matter, right? Because that may be all the editor-in-chief reads. They might, or they might go to the last paragraph or so if you have a conclusion section, right? They may read that, they may not. They're, I guarantee you they're not reading your entire paper. They don't have time. So know what is novel and stated which means excellent scholarship. You must know, identify the knowledge gap that you filled in your scientific paper. And if others have already filled that knowledge gap and you claim you're the first to fill it, then 
That's not excellent scholarship, which is knowing the scientific literature. Not long ago, a first year graduate student in my lab went home for the Christmas holiday, and it was gonna be three weeks. And before she left, I, I said, hey, you need to read a bunch of scientific papers. This is your first year, so you get up to speed on X topic. And she said, well, how many? And I said, oh, 100 or 125, which was really about three or four a day um, over the break. And the reason is and that I wanted to have her work. You know, I wasn't trying to work her to death. I wanted her to take a break. But one thing, if you're passionate about your area of research, then you should want to read those papers. You don't have to read them cover to cover. You might read the title and the abstract and maybe a little bit of the discussion. And if you're really interested in that paper, then you might read the whole thing. But you must get up to speed on the scientific literature. And the earlier you are in your career, the harder that is, because a lot of it is foreign. You may not know the terminology, but by your second or third year in graduate school or by the time you're a postdoc, and you can get through papers fast because you've been doing it. So it's okay to shoot high. Why not try an impact, high impact factor journal first? The worst thing they can do is have the editor in chief do triage and reject it out of hand, and usually you know that within a week or 10 days. But let's say they, the editor-in-chief sends it out, and you get two or three anonymous reviews, and then they reject it. Well, that's disheartening, but now you got three likely worldwide experts in your field to read and comment on your paper. You're gonna learn a lot from that. So it is okay to shoot high, that is, you may not think your paper is good enough for an impact factor journal of four or five or six, but why not give it a try? There's no real harm in that. So I'm gonna talk about regular journals and pay for play journals. I think this is a, a bit unfortunate that in the last 10 to 15 years, there are before, 15 to 20 years ago and before, you sometimes had to pay page charges because journals had to publish pages that went into libraries and that was expensive. So they might charge you, if you have a 10 page article, they might charge you 20 American dollars a page, $200, not trivial money. But now, when I was an editor, and I won't say the name of this journal, but when I would reject a paper for our top flight journal, they, the, the uh, editor-in-chief would often forward it to another journal that would charge you $2,000, American dollars, to publish that paper. That's a conflict of interest, right? So instead of just evaluating the quality of the science, you go, whoa, wait a minute, you mean if we publish this journal? Uh, this paper, you're going to make, they're going to make this society will make $2,000. This is a, a big debate within the sciences, but just be aware, look carefully, whether you're submitting a paper to the journal that is, can charge you even more than $2,000 American dollars to publish it. And there, most journals do not do this. So just be aware that that is, that is out there. In my personal opinion, I think that's an unwelcome development in scientific publishing. So another is friend of, we call them friend of court reviews from colleagues. Find a colleague at your university, the University of Lagos, or the University of Abuja, or if you're at the University of Abuja and there's somebody at the University of Lagos who knows the area, send them an email. Say, would you be willing to read a draft of my manuscript. I know, Dr. Johnson, you're an expert in this area. So you must get input, what I call friend of court reviews. Oh, and by the way, it's just fine to go outside of Nigeria. If there is an expert on, in my area, I st I've been studying tropical forests in Central and South America. So if I was doing research here on tropical forests, I might send a draft of what I had written to a close colleague in Central or South America or to a tropical biologist in North America. 
and you, you can cold email these people. Hi, I'm a PhD student, postdoc, young scientist in Nigeria. I know you're an expert on this topic. Would you be willing to take a quick look at my manuscript? Why not? The worst thing they can do, not reply or say no. But I, I assure you, often, whatever that might be, they're going to say sure. And they might, you know, wow, someone from Nigeria is asking me to take a look at this topic. Sure, I want to help that person. And they'll so seek out those, seek out your peers in grad school or in wherever you are in academia, from graduate school all the way to, to professors. Seek out your colleagues and ask them to review and critique your manuscript. And that's where politeness is the poison of all good collaboration. You want them, you'd much rather hear it from them and then fix it before you send it out to, uh, for publication at an international journal. The funds, I say finding a senior collaborator and considering asking them to join as an author. This has happened to me mainly from my Chinese colleagues I often, when I was, before I was retired, I'd have Chinese scholars, graduate students, and professors come and spend a semester in my lab. And later down the road, they would write a manuscript that I would be an author on. And they'd say, Dr. Carson, would you be willing to invest a lot of time into helping uh, organize and hone the hypotheses and look at the statistical techniques? And if you can do this, we will make you a junior collaborate, junior author. And it's a win-win for both. Um, it's a win-win um, for me because I get to become a co-author. As this happened, this only happened five or six times in my career. But if you have an expert, either in Nigeria, West Africa, Europe, North America, that you think knows the area really well and maybe, maybe better than you do, well, email that person and ask them whether they might consider joining as a co-author, what's the worst thing that can happen? They, they say, no thanks, that's kind of the worst thing. Science is a collaborative process. We all collaborate with outstanding colleagues. And I guarantee you, those listening here now, online, you here in the audience, I guarantee you, some of you know more about a topic than I do, even though I might be writing on it. I may do, we come back and do some research on tropical forests here. So I, was, I visited the Leckie Conservation Center, and I'm fascinated by that urban tropical forest. Oh, I saw my first python in the wild ever. I'm standing there on the walkway. I look down, and the guy goes, there, there's a python. Yes, yes. And so, um, so that was so cool for me, and I, I find that forest fascinating. And if I would come back, um, to teach here um, in Nigeria, um, I, I, that, I find that forest of interest scientifically. But of course, people here know that forest better than I do. So if I started doing research on that forest, I'm reaching out for collaborators. So because they have knowledge, I do not. So Springer Nature services uh, and tools for your next submission. It's another place to go. Look up Stringer Nature and see. You'll have, you might have to Google around a little bit to find their advice for submissions. And Springer Nature publishes the world's most, most important journal, probably Nature, right? And then a bunch of others. They have Nature Medicine, Nature Ecology Evolution, other journals. Um, ah, I'm going to get this. You, the first paragraph of the discussion. You've introduced the topic, you've written a compelling title, a compelling abstract, they've read your introduction, your materials and methods, and results. Finally, they make it to the discussion. Use the first paragraph and keep it fairly short to just overwhelm your reviewers, right? Reviews are anonymous, right? You send it off to an editor-in-chief, she sends it off to a subject matter editor, and then you get these anonymous reviews, two or three. And that person is probably reviewing. I have reviewed thousands of grants and manuscripts in my 35 year career. We're tired. Sometimes it's 10 o'clock at night. And I know I have to get that review back. 
And so when I get to the first paragraph of the discussion, I want to be gobsmacked in the face about what the important findings you're conveying in that manuscript. So again, these are just some basic, basic tips. Can I get the third slide? By the way, when I first gave these presentations in Abuja, I had no slides at all. And then uh, uh, Clemson was like, Dr. Carson, you need to have a few PowerPoint slides. Like, okay, I'll put some basic slides together. So, and if they, the slides really go down, I will, I'm a really good, piano, I will, I'm a singer, and so I will sing a song. No, I will not sing a song. I'm a horrible singer. I'm not, I'm, I'm not even making this joke. I was in my youth choir at my church. Uh, when I was a kid, the youth choir director called my mother up and said, I sing so off tune and so loud, she was willing to work with me one on one. And my mother simply said, well, really, they called me Wally, really Wally, <laughs> young alpha boys don't sing in the church choir. So I just left the church choir and got no training. And I've never gotten over this. 55 years later. Um, so you're laughing. I see maybe some of you out there are laughing. It was, it, anyway, whatever. Um, that's not true. I'm just waiting for the next slide. <laughs> By the way, that was an absolutely true story. Um, of, yes, and I never learned. My mom didn't tell me for about three or four years later that she had done that to me. So... So I, I'm, I'm not even sure what, what is the next. Oh, okay. The next slide is about applying to graduate school um, into probably into North America, applies to the U.S., Canada, probably to areas of Western Europe. And so I'm going to tell you right now that just two and a half years ago or so, I published a paper with the amazing title, Advice to Applying to Graduate School in ecology and evolution, colon, how to prepare and a step-by-step -step guide. And that paper, it's easy to download, just pop, type Walter Carson, advice to applying to graduate school. I have the full, oh, top, oh, that's then I need the next one. I think it's the first, uh, the top of the next one, it's up there, is the full citation. So, anyway, I'll read again. It's called uh, adv uh, Applying to Graduate School, Advice on Applying to Graduate School. There it is. Um, Carson et al. Whoa. Yes. So, the second one, uh, it's with eight colleagues, graduate students, um, and postdocs, and other faculty. There it is. There's the title. It's published in the Bulletin of the Ecological Society of America. It's a free download. And give, if you know of anyone who's finishing a master's and wants to go do a PhD, an undergrad who wants to apply to the US, um, this, and this guide would help you even in molecular biology, pretty much anywhere in the sciences. Um, so I wanna go to this at the top. If you get admitted to graduate school in a PhD program at big research universities, most granting PhDs, certainly the top 75 research universities in the United States, graduate school is free, tuition free. Let me also say they're going to pay you about somewhere between 18 to 30,000 a year to attend graduate school. Now, some are, sometimes you're on fellowships, sometimes you have to teach part time, about 20 hours a week. But the other 20 to 30 hours, whatever you work, is you do your research towards your PhD. They also will typically provide you full health benefits. And at the University of Pittsburgh, we did all of those things and we gave you a brand new computer, either a PC or Mac for free the day you were the first week you were in the program. So now I'm not saying it's easy to get admitted. It is difficult, but it's certainly not impossible. And I'm gonna go through a few things to help. Um, so there are four things you, four things get you, yes, four things get you into graduate school. Here's what those four things are. Your grades. Did you perform well in your classes? 
And in the US, we're on a 4.0 scale. So just convert your whatever your grade point average is to a four point scale. Second, um, many of you may heard, have heard of the GRE, the graduate record exam. Fortunately, in the United States, graduate programs are moving away from requiring the GRE. And many feel it is biased against underrepresented groups in the United States. And also, if you're wealthy, you can hire someone to, to coach you in taking that exam, or you can buy something online or download something free online to help you prepare. Probably about a third of the major research universities in the United States no longer require the GRE. So if you don't like those kind of exams, trust me, I didn't like the GRE. I took it twice. I hated taking it both times. Um, but so then try to find universities that don't require it. On the other hand, if you're really good in those exams, if you perform well on, there's a quantitative portion, there's a verbal portion, and there's one other portion that I now forget. You, you may, somebody's saying they, they know. Um, then take the exam and you can, in your cover letter or your personal statement, even if they don't require it, you can say, well, in the math, I provided in the 96th percentile. That's impressive, right? And so you can let them know. It's another way to convey your knowledge, even if they don't require the GRE. So I said four things. The first was grades. Second was GREs. The third is letters of recommendation. And there is a little bit of an art. I have written thousands of letters of recommendation from everything to medical school, dental school, and primarily to master's and PhD programs in the sciences. So here's what you wanna do if you identify a professor, and you'll need three of these, that you know will write you a strong letter. And it's incumbent upon you to make it easy for your letter writer. Get that request into them early, send them a copy of your resume or CV, more likely a CV in academia, and then in the email to them, with your resume or CV attached, place five bullets or numbered items, and you're sending this to the professor now, what makes you a compelling applicant, all right? So, and that could be anything from, I'm not, I'm not joking here in any way, you were the lead singer in a major Nigerian band, and you had two CDs. Why? That, that you really, do people release CDs anymore? They're on YouTube. <laughs> I think I'm behind the times. Here's why. It does two things. One, it makes you look at you. That, I literally wrote, there was a guy uh, four years ago who actually had his own band. He toured the United States in his own band and was the lead singer. I thought that was pretty incredible. It makes him seem like, wow, he's broadly trained in the arts and the sciences. It also makes the university, the person who looks at those recommendations, to go, wow, that professor knows that person because he or she knew that they were in a band. There can be all sorts. I just wrote another recommendation for a, a woman who was really involved in philanthropy, charities at the University of Pittsburgh all four years. She invented, came up with the charity. She became president of that charity and, and basically raised thousands and thousands of dollars. That goes to the core to who she was. And I wrote that into her recommendation that I just sent off uh, two months ago. So, look. Oh. So, the fourth thing that gets you admitted to graduate school, in my view, is the most important but the other three are important too. The other thing, by the way, I want to touch one more thing about your letter. Your, it, it's important that your professor or letter writer says something that you love research. That is what graduate school is all about. It is not taking classes. Graduate classes in, in the United States are easier than our undergraduate classes on average. Just all. And that's true from university to university. So it's not the grades you get, it's the research you do. And I hope that if you go to graduate school, your research isn't work to you, 
It's your passion. I am doing more research now as a retired professor because I don't have teaching commitments because research is my passion. And it's my passion at 65, and it was my passion at 25 as a master's student. So, so that research experience is really important. So four things, grades, GREs, letters of recommendation, and demonstrate that you have research experience because that's what graduate school, master's and PhD programs is all about. So cold emails are fine. The idea you can send an email, find professors, whether it's in Europe, whether it's out in somewhere other part of West Africa or in the US, and there's somebody, Julie Smith, is doing research and you think it's fascinating. Just send her an email. Say, say who you are and by whatever you do, do not use, I call them, generic emails. We will spot a blasted email. You've written one paragraph or two and we can tell you sent it to everybody. And when I get that email, delete, delete, delete. However, I get an email that says, Dear Dr. Carson, um, I, I'd like to apply to do a PhD program in your lab. I recently read two of your papers, and now you can just get online, my website or Google Scholar, download it. And then this really intrigued me. Your finding about X is an area I'm really passionate about. So that says, you looked up who I am, you've read some of my papers, and and you keep, you keep that email very short, no longer than seven or eight sentences. But it conveys to me that you looked into the research that I did. I will always reply to that email, always. And I've had hundreds and hundreds of them, maybe only to say, I'm so sorry, I'm not taking on students in the next, um, in, the, in the fall semester. We go, students are admitted in September of each year. By the way, the article that I wrote on advice or applying to graduate school, we'll go into all this even in more detail. So attach a CV and not a resume. Academicians and professors, we have curriculum data, CVs. So if you attach a resume, attaching a CV knows you're a little more savvy. You know that in academia, we use CVs. So, um, they say publish a paper or report. Let's say you work for a professor and you wrote up a report for something. I wrote up a report for United Nations Man and Biosphere Project when I was in Ghana. And it was never published in a peer-reviewed journal. But, and so it was a report. It was a long report. It was like 65 pages. I put my life into that report. But so I let the professor know that I had published this report. I didn't send it to them because it was so long, but then that it was on my CV. And I could also say, I've written this report. If you'd like to see a copy, please let me know and I can send it. Why do you do that? Because it shows you have research experience and that you wrote that research up into some final product. That is a sign that, you, that you've done research. So those are really all I, all I really have to say, and much of it um, you can get in the paper that I wrote and in uh, the thing on the top 10 writing tips and the psychology behind it. Um, so I'm happy to entertain questions from any of you. Um, and I, I think that's, is there anything else? I think that's it. If something else comes to me, I'll bring it up. But please, I'd love to answer questions. Thank you so much. Uh, I think that was a wonderful yes, presentation from you. I'm back. Um, yeah, yes, I'm hearing. I have hearing aids, oh, so I'm a bit hearing impaired. I'm interested in the first slide. What's that? The first slide. You want me to put it up? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. Yes, can you hear me now? Yes. All right. Thank you so much, so, uh, Professor. That was a wonderful uh, presentation. Um, please, for those of you that have questions for Professor Carson, please go ahead. Um,
indicate by using your virtual hand and ask your questions quickly. So I can I get that microphone back? I think there's going to be. Oh, there was just a question. Yeah, Daniel, uh, Daniel from computer is coordinating the questions. Okay. So just want to increase the volume okay. so that we can hear. Let's see, we have a question for you. You answer yeah. them for me. Everybody, all the questions. Oh, thank you. Great. Okay. And then, yes, people. So, Mr. Dan, go ahead, please. Okay. Uh, please. So, for those of you who have questions, please indicate. And if you're on Facebook Live, please also send in your question. We can just pick them up and push them to Prof. Uh, but why you are trying to put your questions together, I have uh, just a few questions for Prof. Prof, if you can hear me loud and clear. I can. Okay, uh, my first question would be, what are the key components of a well-structured scientific research paper? What are the key structural components? Are the key components of well-structured scientific research paper? So yeah, that's generally pretty straightforward. Um, you're gonna have uh, a title, abstract. Um, often under the abstract, you'll have keywords. I didn't comment on that, but um, you wanna find keywords that will hone people in and you'll list six to 10 of them. And then you have introduction, materials and methods, results, discussion. Um, and then make sure, by the way, you have acknowledgments. Now imagine, and then you have literature cited, and then you'll have you know tables, figures, etc. Sometimes the tables and figures are enmeshed within the document, within the introduction to the discussion. But one of the things, if you get someone who's an expert in the field to read a draft of your manuscript, and everybody might recognize this person as a world expert, and that person read it for you. You can acknowledge that. I want to thank Dr. Jenny Johnson for reading my reading a draft and making comments. And then everybody knows that this expert read your paper and it's perfectly legitimate. And also you can cite, you can cite your colleagues, your graduate student peers, your postdoc peers. Thank the people that commented. And that conveys to the reviewer. That conveys the editor in chief and subject matter editor that you got external comments before sending that thing in. Okay, and the acknowledgments should also comment on funding, thank funding sources, et cetera. Um, so I'm trying to think if there is anything else, but that's the basic structure and it varies by journal. Um, the length of the abstract can vary from 100 words to 350 or 400. All right, thank you so much. Um, let's quickly take a question from Mr. Simi. Mr. Simi, please unmute yourself and ask your question, please. Uh, please, how do we get the slide? I don't know if the slide can be, be available at the uh, air spaces, sir. Uh. Sorry, for those of you that want to actually watch this series again, please kindly check our Facebook page. I just shared that uh, in the chat box. So kindly check uh, check our chat box and you see uh, how to actually access it via our Facebook. So you can actually watch this over and over again. Uh, okay, let's go through American Center Lagos. Please unmute and speak, please. Okay, I have a question. We can just walk into yes. it. Oh, okay. Yes. Let me just say, I think my voice is loud. Yes, go ahead. I'm interested in the. No, I don't need the mic. No, there's air coming through. Oh, so I can't hear it. No, go ahead. I think. Let me just ask you, and I'll repeat your question for everyone. I'm interested in the, the detail of the 10 top writing tips. So, boy, Ben. How do they arrive at the 35 word sentence? Was it a big challenge or was it cited by the Okay, first of all, 35 word sentence is not in the top 10 tips. It is my own that I came up with. So um, I've been told it's arbitrary. I just know. So I challenge all of you. If you, if you look at a 35 word sentence and you wrote a 45 word sentence and you think it's fine, then you can just disre tr truly disregard it. 
I only know that for me, my trainees and graduate students, my collaborators, it just seems to work. Now, there's a difference. It's not a hard cutoff. You can have 38 words, right? But I have always noted, once you get into many more than 40 words, then how many times do you have to go back and reread the sentence? And it could be that I've just gotten old <laughs> and I've gotten a little senile. So I, I just challenge any of you to, to try it. And if it works for you, wonderful. And if it doesn't, then you can disregard it. You think tips so. You take tips on writing the, the first of the slides. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, is, it, is it topic or something? Yeah, it's online. Yeah, it's all online. Oh. Yes, yeah, and, and, and it's easy. You can find it in seconds. Um, yes. Okay, so uh, assuming someone has submitted an application without mentioning uh, journal publications she got involved with, is it likely, can I, can I send an email to the school? To, to the university. To the university, yeah. So how applications are going to work in the U.S. at almost all graduate programs, you're going to be able to apply online and you're going to have uh, a personal statement. You're going to fill in what your, maybe what your GRE scores were. They'll require a line for your grades. Um, they may ask you to also download, upload a resume or CV, but you want to catch the attention of a professor. For me, at the University of Pittsburgh, do you know how many times I looked at applications that came in without, it would be zero. Because students, I would get four to 10 emails each September, usually coming earlier. Actually, they would come in beginning in October. So if someone right now might be emailing me, this is December, for admission in September of 24. Usually it's a once a year process. We only admit students in the United States and Canada as well, once a year, and that's in September. If they have emailed me and I've looked at their resume and I've looked at their research experience, then I might go look at their application where they have a personal state. But I've gotten most of what I need from that CV and their email. Um, and I can learn more from the personal statement. Um, but it's important that you can because you want to, professors want to, you apply to work with me, I love your application, and I'm sitting around a room with the, the committee that is vetting those applicants. And I want to say to my colleagues, this person has applied, I got an email, look at the resume, we might have exchanged four, or five, or six emails. So once I get an email and reply back, I'll usually have some questions for a prospective applicant in that email. So absolutely, you can apply to the university, right? Without identifying a professor, I advise you not to do that. Okay? And you may, you might have to email 30 professors, right? And, and, and so you, you have to develop a thick skin. You might email a professor and within 24 hours get a reply back. You might email 12 professors and still not get a reply back. You have to be persistent. That's the only thing I can say. Um, and now, typically in the last five, six years, I was either Skyping with a student or more recently Zoom. I would have a Zoom interview, an informal interview, not official. So it's all about, remember, you're going to be in that professor's lab or PhD for five to six years. The average time to completing a PhD in North America is over five years. And so you're going to want to make sure you have some kind of connection, right? Because you're going to be in my lab, in my office suite. And so I want to, you know, I'm going to try to get a sense. And what happens if you get in touch with me in a Zoom and you're like, good, I don't want to work with that Carson guy. Yuck, <laughs> right? So you want to get a sense whether I might be someone you want to work with. And I was considered by my graduate students really demanding. And I expected a lot of passion about the research. And by the way, I typically was in my office seven days a week. 
because I, I, I had no friends. So I had nothing to do but go into my office. So are there other questions out there? Yes, there are other questions. Uh, let's go to Meduguri. Meduguri, please unmute and ask your question. Go ahead. Um, good afternoon, Prof. Thank you very much for this presentation. Thank you very much for this presentation. We're having two questions here from American Space Meduguri. The first question is that we want like more elaboration about the 35 word synthesis. And the second question is about this edit. Like the 40 draft, is it not too plenty for the writer to compile? Because 40 people are many, because how will the writer compile all the messages or the drafts that have been edited? Is it not too many for him? Thank you very much. Okay, so Daniel, I'm so sorry. Because of my hearing issues, I had a, there was a little garbled for me. Daniel, could you repeat the essence of, the, of that question or questions? Yes, yes uh, I think uh, the first question was on, he wanted you to elaborate further concerning the 35 word sentences. Then I think the second question is on uh, the 40 drafts uh, are not too many. I think he wants you to uh, talk more about that as well. So to reiterate, the 35 word sentence link is, is it's arbitrary. I came up with it after 30 years of writing in the sciences. And if it works for you, wonderful. And if it doesn't, then you can abandon it. Um, and the second question was, there was a 35 words and what was, oh, the 40 drafts. Yes. So I pulled 40 out of thin air, just pulled it out of thin air. I can tell you I've never submitted a manuscript for publication with fewer than 20 drafts. And I've had manuscripts that have had more than 50. And, and it's just a matter of trying. Remember, I mean, science is complex stuff. And so you need to have the best prose you can put together. And that is about writing draft after draft. And once you write a draft, put it aside for three days and go back and read it again. And if all of a sudden you get stuck in the flow of your own writing, you know you need to fix that pair. Right? There's a, a book I read called Art and Fear. And it said writing is easy. You stare at a blank piece of white paper until blood drips from your forehead. Right? <laughs> right? If right, I mean, I, I, I've only known a few scientists whose first few drafts um, were really high quality. Uh, the vast majority go through many, many drafts. Just as simple as that. Other questions? Yes, thank you so much. Uh, let's uh, go to Joss. We don't America, just please on mute and ask your question. Good afternoon, Professor. Hello. Um, I wanted to ask, during your presentation, you made a comment. I wasn't very clear. You said um, we should overwhelm our reviewers with results of our research in our first or introductory paragraph of the article. I wanted to get more clarification on that. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Overwhelm, I, I, I think uh, if I use the word overwhelm, I wish that I hadn't because you don't want to overwhelm your reviewers. In the first paragraph of the discussion, reiterate what you think in, in five to eight sentences are the big take home message. Because your reviewer has gone through this long paper, abstract introduction, materials and methods and results. And then all of a sudden, okay. And then they read that paragraph that, and you wanna wow them in a small, short paragraph. And then you finish that paragraph, the last sentence, down below, we parse out these findings. And there's another thing I failed to mention. And, and, and actually, uh, Burnoff does mention it. And he says, writers, readers need signposts. So break up your materials and methods and results and discussions with bold signposts. 
So you can say, you know, I'm a forest ecologist. So the first thing would be, uh, you know, study location in bold and where the heck we did the study. And then it was sampling the vegetation. Then it was measuring growth rates and then the paragraph about me measuring growth rates all in bold and then statistical analysis and so often scientists are in a hurry we're busy so sometimes we're looking for a specific finding in your paper and we'll open it and flip through and look look for bolded signposts those that are in italics or something and i'm like oh there it is there's the paragraph I need to read. There's the result I wanted. Thank you. On to the next paper. So use signposts. And again, in these top 10 writing tips, he talks about using signposts. This guy he is a legend to me because in three pages, it took me 15 years to learn what he wrote in three pages. Okay, other questions? Thank you so much, uh, Prof. Uh, let's go to Sokoto. Please unmute and ask your questions. Oh, okay. Uh, so, um, uh, good day, everyone. Please, uh, my question is that uh, what are the uh, advices for an undergraduate that has an interest in uh, research? So, the biggest thing Thank I you. can go ahead. So, you know, an undergraduate who hasn't participated in research and wants to apply to graduate school, um, the only thing I can say is, and I just need to be blunt, if you finished your program of four years in biological sciences or uh, in, in medical fields and you've not participated in research, that will put you at a disadvantage. It's not impossible. That's why early in your undergraduate career, knock on a professor's door or see them in the hallway. Don't be shy. Email them and say, you know, professor, I'm fascinated by your research. I'm willing to work for free. I will volunteer to enter data. I will volunteer to go into the field or be a lab person, even if it starts out washing dishes, right? So you need to do that early in your career. So when I advised undergraduates in the United States, and I'm still advising undergrads all over the US, um, and if they, I, I'm advising one right now at Colorado State University, who's in her last semester with no research experience. And she happened to be a very close friend of my niece. And so she emailed me and she said, you know, my, my niece, you know, she told me that you might be able to help me. And I could, I literally had a data set that was simple. And we zoomed several times. I sent her the data set and she at this very moment um, just moved um, out, out of, away from Colorado State and is now writing a scientific paper with me. She's very smart. And so here was a chance, even at the end of her career, I just handed her a data set and said, bye bye, you know, go read a bunch of scientific papers and I promise you, if you devote yourself to this within less than four months, we will be able to submit a first, you will be the first author, not me. Because you're gonna analyze it, you're gonna write the first draft, and then I will coach you from there. So even if you graduated, if you can get back in touch with a professor and say, gee darn, I wish I had gotten involved in undergraduate research. So, um, yeah, so any undergrads out there that are in the early part of your career and you like science, any part of science, find a mentor. By the way, graduate students make great mentors. So you may be scared of professors. I don't know, are, are, some professors in the United States are really scary. I don't know whether professors here are as scary or not. I, I have no idea. So, but sometimes <laughs> they can be intimidating, right? and you don't want to sound foolish, well then find a graduate student in that professor's lab and ask her, hey, can, can you help me on this topic I'm interested in and I'd like to learn about it before I get the nerve to knock on the professor's door. And then when you knock on his or her door, you say, oh, doctor, 
professor, I've read these 25 papers that you've written with your grad students. I'm fascinated. And I would bet even here with an intimidating professor, that person is going to be impressed because you've read their scientific papers. So, all right, is there another question? Yes, sir. Okay, I have a, I have a question here uh, in the live audience. Yes, sir, really loud. Okay, good afternoon, Paul. Please, what about those of us in the arts? Because I'm in the arts. Talking about science, how do we get mentors for the arts? So that that is a really good good question, and I think let me say what I that one I'm not very informed on how to do that. I will give you the few times I have collaborated with artists, and that piece of art is now up at my place in Pittsburgh, and we needed a computer graphic artist to describe the architecture, the three-dimensional structure of wet tropical forests in Costa Rica. And we asked her to do that. And I paid her for it um, to do that. And then she did this beautiful piece of artwork that is now published, that came out in 2020 in a major scientific journal, is her artwork. So I think there's a way to integrate art into science, but I, I just have little experience, I'm sorry. Excuse me, sir. Oh, I think um, talking about arts and humanities, social sciences. In, in, in this, oh, I see. Okay, in finding a mentor within the social sciences. Here is the challenge in the United States and probably Canada as well. Um, STEM fields have these teaching assistantships where you get paid part-time to teach labs, whether they be a microbiology lab, a physiology lab, an ecology lab. And so you, get, you don't pay tuition, you get paid to teach those classes, and you get health benefits. Unfortunately, in the United States, the humanities and social sciences are not as well-funded. They typically don't have the same resources that STEM fields do. Um, I, I don't think that's right. I think more resources should go to the humanities and social sciences, but it just seems uh, a fact of funding in the U.S. There are fellowships available in linguistics, in English literature, in history, but they are far fewer than in STEM. Um, that's, that, that's, a, that's a challenging issue that is way above my head with deans and, and provosts. And you should know, I try to stay away from all administrators my entire career, I'm teasing. Um, so, okay, other questions? Yes, uh, there's another question here, uh, which is coming directly from me. Uh, it says, what are the ethical considerations when writing about human or animal in scientific research? Could you could you ask that again? What are the ethical considerations when writing about human or animal in scientific research? Okay, so what are what are the article ethical, 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 ethical considerations? Considerations. Ethical considerations. Oh, ethical. Thank you. I'm sorry. Please know this is my hearing issue. Ethical considerations. Oh my. Um, I never did. So in the United States, you have to file with your university. If you're going to do anything that where you study humans in a, in a concerted way, it has to go way up the chain at the university. And then you have, it's called an IACOP. And that be, and they give you permission to do that research. Um, and the same is true for animals. It's even tougher to get to do human research, a higher bar, but you have to go to IACOC if you want to, let's say you want to live trap mammals. So I want to live trap small mammals. Oh, God, God forbid if you want to work on primates in the field. That's even, that's tougher and it can be very controversial. So um, I recently was involved in Ecuador where we were interviewing indigenous women in a remote part of the Amazon we submitted an IACOC protocol, and we were told that we didn't have to do that, 
that because we were only interviewing them with the questionnaire in person, uh, we just had to make sure we recorded their voice saying they we they had we had approval to interview them. So it just it, it, it in the U.S. it's it's very complicated. And I was involved with the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Panama, where there was a big controversy about radio collars that had been put on uh, spider monkeys. And it looked like the radio collars were causing harm around their necks. And it became, uh, I was not involved directly in the research, but it became a big, big controversy. And this is 10 years ago when I was uh, in Panama. So yeah, there are huge ethical considerations. Those will vary by country. Those will vary by the animal species. Uh, and those will vary whether you're studying humans versus non-humans. Good question, by the way. Thank you very much. Uh, all right, uh, we'll take one more question. Uh, then I will check if there, is a, if there are actually any questions from our Facebook page, then I will push that to you as well. Uh, what... What are the common pitfalls to avoid in scientific research? Ah. What are the common loop? What what was the word you used? The common pitfalls. Okay, got it. Thank you. Um, pitfalls. Um, thank, thanks. Subtle differences in language. I'm so sorry. Um, what are the common pitfalls? Um, I'm gonna say. The most important pitfall is a lack of a work ethic. You've got to be devoted, you've got to be passionate, and you've got to put the time in. And I think if you're devoted and passionate, your professor or whoever you're working with will see that passion and devotion. So I think work ethic is very, very important. Um, at the same time, if you work too hard and you work all the time, then you may suffer mental health problems as a result of this maniacal work ethic. So it's a balance. There's a work-life balance. During the pandemic at my university, I saw a number of PhD students who were very talented sort of implode. They lived alone. They're home by themselves. They were no longer. I was the only person during the pandemic allowed to go into my lab. I was declared essential personnel. None of my graduate students were declared essential personnel. So they're home alone, working remote. So I think uh, to major challenges is you have to be committed, you have to be passionate, you have to work hard. Um, the other pitfall is, as I said before, from the book, Art and Fear, writing is easy. You stare at a blank piece of white paper until blood drips from your forehead. Writing is hard and you have to it's hard to understand how many drafts you need to go through it can also be greatly rewarding when you get that first paper accepted i will never forget i think i may have said my first paper was in the african journal of ecology and i couldn't have been more excited because it was a publication out of my work with the peace corps on the accra plains of ghana north of accra by about 150 kilometers um so Work ethic, ability to write, um, and and mental health challenges. One final one is, you know, just at times, laboratory work can be lonely. Sometimes you're in the lab, and it's late at night um, or early in the morning. No one else is there, but you have to see that lab experiment through, and that takes perseverance and commitment. So, I mean, they're... they're in my experience, most PhD students that started PhDs in my lab and others, at least 80% of them, 8 of 10, went on to get their PhD and complete it. So once you jump in, usually people see it through to the end. And by the way, find support networks. Um, find, you know, your lab cohort, everybody who started the PhD at the same time that you did. Develop that community of fellow scientists, all starting at about the same place. You, there were five postdocs that came in together. Create a community with them. There were 10 PhD students that all started their PhD in biology 
or medical science is all about the same time. Find your community and use that as a support network. Because let me tell you, uh, I did cry in graduate school. I will tell you, I remember crying. I'm an assistant professor, a new professor at the University of Pittsburgh. I was doing a huge experiment in tropical forests in Panama. I had a large grant to fund this big experiment, and it was my first experiment research in tropical forests. This is about 1995. And I, we spent the first day, and I had to sample 700 stands of tropical forest. And with a field team of 12 people, I got one done. One. That means I'm going to be here 700 straight days <laughs> sampling that damn forest. So we get back on the trail at the end of the day. It used to rain every afternoon. I sent everybody back ahead of me, and I started crying. And I'm walking down there. It's pouring down rain. Tears are going down my face. And I'm thinking, my career is over. This experiment is never going to work. But I had to, to, you know, get back to where the lab was, where the clearing was. We were all staying. We had dinner. I then had some rum. Yes, I admit it. I had some rum. Because, but then I got up the next day and said, wait a minute. Let's, maybe we just had encountered a bad plot, which is what happened. By coincidence, it happened to be one of the most difficult of the 700 to sample. And by the time my field crew got with it, we were doing 10 to 20 a day. So, but remember, you're going to have those days, and I'm going to say as a male, it's okay to cry, <laughs> and maybe that will be good part, right? So let the tears go now and then. Um, yeah, I, I cried in graduate school a few times, too. But this is really the first time in a public forum I'm admitting any of my tears. So, all right, is there another question? Enough of my crying. <laughs> all right. <laughs> There's another question, Prof. Thank you so much. Um, how do how do we commercialize our research output for economic value? Yeah, you're gonna have to ask it again. Can somebody repeat that question for me? How do we commercialize how, our uh, commercialize our research? Yes. Right. So in in some ways, to so I'll be honest. I don't know the answer to that. I was a forest ecologist. I did study things about logging, um, but I never tried to commercial commercialize or make a profit from my research because my research was basic research. Now, medical research, if you have a cool finding, a new treatment for some malady, sure. Um, if you have an invention, my, my research never lent itself to trying to commercialize it or patent any of my findings. And so that's just outside. That's a great question. Um, but often universities have offices to help you. If you have a key finding, you can go to that office at a university and they will help you get a patent or make, make profit from your finding. Now, the university will likely try to take a cut of that profit. Um, but that's a great question just outside of what I know about. Yes. All right. Uh, Samuel, do we have questions on Facebook? Hold on. Let me take one live question here with a live audience. Is that okay? Okay. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. I'd like to give you advice on how to better handle public of interest in research. So, you want to tell No, please do. I said I want to ask you to give us a few advice on how to better handle conflict of interest in research. Okay, good point. Okay, great question. I thought you were going to give me ideas. I'm like, hey. <laughs> so I was handing the mic away. Um, conflict of interest. Um, I'm trying to think um, where I have. So the only place I've really encountered conflict of interest is when journals are charging a lot of money to publish your research. I think that's a horrible conflict of interest. But I mean, you're thinking of conflict of interest in your collaborators. The only challenge, there's one ethical challenge, and it's not necessarily a conflict of interest. In my entire scientific career, 
there was just one time when I was a young professor where a senior professor stole my idea, wrote a grant, and then got it funded. And I, I'm going to tell you who that is. No, I'm not going to give her name away. I've never forgotten that. But I'm happy to say in 35 years of collaborations, it's happened to me one time that someone, I think it's much more important to share your ideas with others and put that somebody's going to steal your idea out of the back of your mind, right? Because it's just unlikely to happen. And maybe the most famous case ever is some of you may know about what happened to Rosalind Franklin, who did not co-author a paper with Watson and Crick. Um, and the head of the lab all those years ago, this is 70 years ago now, the head of the lab, she had done x-ray diffraction where she was able to see it was a double helix and she was really good at that research. And the head of the lab that was over her and was over Watson and Crick, she didn't agree to give them her result, but the head of the lab did. And it was his right to do that as head of the lab. Was he allowed to do it? Yes. Should he have done it? In my view, absolutely not. But everybody now knows that it wasn't just Watson and Crick, and the other person on that paper was Maurice Wilkins, but that Rosalind Franklin made a major contribution. And she's now, everybody knows, it's Watson, Crick, Rosalind Franklin. So I don't, I very rarely have encountered unethical behavior. Um, and thankfully, I think as scientists, um, I hope you're honest, we have a high integrity, and I'd much rather be sharing my ideas freely than be nervous that someone will steal one. But I, I study forests, and it's complex stuff, and there's lots of theories to explain how forests function. But, you know, nobody's, nobody's stealing ideas in, in the area of research I spent 40 years in. Yes, in another live audience question. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, I was just seated and thinking about uh, research methods. I know in scientific uh, research, uh, majority of the scientists use uh, qualitative methods. Um, do we have re scientific research that uses for, for I mean, uh, no, reverse. the reverse, exactly. So a lot of scientists use quantitative methods, yeah, sure. So now, in your career, have you had an opportunity to see scientific research that uses qualitative methods? Uh, honestly, not very often, um, just because field ecology, forest biology is very quantitative. Um, and so, you know, the, the biggest, some of you may want to Google the name. Um, in the field of animal behavior, seems to be prone to some ethical violations. And I will only say if you Google the name Jonathan Pruitt, P-R-U-I-T-T, -T, um, he was involved in one of the biggest scandals in the last 50 plus years in the, in the, uh, in the field of animal behavior. At the age of 33, um, he had published 170 scientific papers, 170. He got his PhD at 24. Did he, did, was he fraudulent? Did he make data up? Um, I don't know. I wasn't involved. I happened to be one of his best friends. Uh, I am no longer in touch with him. Uh, he lost his job at McMaster University in Canada and the University of Tennessee in the United States pulled his dissertation. You can no longer find it. So um, I didn't see the results of the investigation, but this was a huge, McMaster University probably spent a million dollars on its investigation of this guy that I thought was a genius and was one of my closest friends. I traveled with him to Australia in uh, February of 2020, at the beginning of the pandemic, um, to collect data with him. 
So, um, I, I mean, and, and a lot of data in animal behavior is probably a little more qualitative than it is. Um, but this goes back to the issue of ethics and science. What I don't like, one of the reasons I retired when I did, one, um, I will tell you one of the reasons I retired when I did, I lived in Pittsburgh and my girlfriend lived in California in Santa Rosa. So I knew if I could retire, in fact, she and I just drove across the country from Pittsburgh to California. So I knew I could spend a lot of time with her. Um, so now I just lost track of where I was going. Oh, I know, because the pressure on scientists to get grants and publish their paper in high impact factor journals, in my view, is over the top. And I am now, I won't be a co-author on this, but I'm working with a journalist on the, well, what he argues, he's writing a book on fraud in science. And I will give you one other story. There are three fraud sleuths. I can't remember their names. They're at prominent universities, uh, one at the University of Pennsylvania, the other one I don't remember where, and the other is in France. They spotted fraud by a person studying, get this, honesty. So she's studying things. When are you more likely to be honest when you're doing some task? And it turns out that she was probably not honest. And you don't have to make this stuff up. You don't. And so she's at one of the top, she's at an Ivy League institution in the United States, which are premier institutions. And she has now filed a $200 million lawsuit against these three sleuths. So this thing is going to get pretty nasty. But what I want to go back is, yes, I think there's too much pressure on scientists to publish in high impact factor journals, to get their grants funded. And that's a shame. But fundamentally, we have to be honest. We have to have integrity. Scientists need to hold themselves up that it is truth, it is evidence-based reasoning, and that you can go um, to us to get legitimate answers. In the United States, the vaccines for COVID were horribly politicized, and it is so unfortunate. Uh, I personally think they saved my life. I was in the AstraZeneca trial early on in the US, um, and I got the placebo, darn it. Um, but anyway, we have to trust our top scientists that they are giving us the best evidence they have. Um, and it's so, it's just mortifying to me that, um, that, that our integrity as scientists is being questioned. Sorry, I went on with that answer much too long. Uh, and it started with quantitative versus qualitative. And uh, Clemson, thank you for a great question. Uh, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Professor Carlson, uh, for sharing your word of experience with us. Um, we're right on time, and I was hoping that we don't extend further, so that we don't keep people waiting for far too long. But, uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's put our hands together for Prof. Uh, that was a very important event. Thank you so much, and I want to reiterate: if you have any questions, it's been a pleasure to be here. My trip here to Nigeria over the last decade, the decade, 10 days, has been wonderful. Uh, I leave on Friday, um, but email me at walterpagecarson at gmail.com, and I will answer your questions. And if I don't, email me again and make it me. Come on. Anyway, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Prof. Uh, all right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for participating for today's event. Uh, we are happy that uh, you all seated very tight and you asked a very important question. And I believe that we all learned something new today. And indeed, we are very grateful to Prof for being on our program. Uh, we hope that uh, we'll see you again next week, especially during our uh, Youth Development Series program on Tuesday and also our MOOC program, which actually usually come by 10 a.m. For those of you that uh, you are coming to the American space for the first time, thank you all for joining us. Please, next time, come with a friend, invite somebody as well. Thank you all for being part of our program. Bye for now.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, you guys are so welcome. Thank you. Bye-bye.